outro cast. Jed, uh, how is your day going aside from me adding the pressure of an interview, you know, <laughs> on opening day of the theater run of this or the theatrical run rather? It's going great because I'm in New York City and I haven't been here in several years and I love it here. And I really feel lucky that I get to kind of run around town and see the things that I used to see. Uh, so yeah, it's great. Can't, can't complain. Right. So congrats on the film getting its theatrical run. It came out, what, initially a year and a half ago at South by Southwest? Correct. Yes. So how does the cut that the people at South by saw compare to what's in the theaters? It's the same one. Yeah. Uh, it just, you know, up until that point, there was a lot of scramble to try to kind of figure out what our cut was going to be for the festival. But once we figure that out and put it out there, it hasn't changed. So um, actually, there, well, there is one little thing at the very end of the film where we just sort of have a little card because Gary has passed away. So right. we just added something that kind of commemorates him and explains that he passed and, and uh, talks briefly about South by Southwest and how he was there. And we have some photos and things of that that we included in the credits. But other than that, it's the same thing. Correct. So, yeah, Gary, we lost last year. When yeah. did you finish the film versus Gary's passing? So the film was finished for South by Southwest. And then, so it was, it was, you know, sometime where he, um, before he passed. So he, he had plenty of uh, opportunities to see the film and, and mm -hmm. uh, see screenings of it. So he was at South by with us. And um, so one of the like notable things about him as a performer was that he would hand out items to the crowds and he would just, whatever he could come up with right. pennies and goofy things that he would just do. And so, for South by he handed out bananas to people, which was a lot of fun. And like he signed a couple of bananas, which was great. Um, I don't know how long those are going to last, but uh, you know, the, yeah, it was, it was, you know, he, he was really full of life because this was kind of the culmination of many years of making this movie. And I don't, I don't know if he had expectations for it, but he certainly really loved the attention he was getting. And uh, we all really enjoyed watching him have that uh, experience. In the last 20 years, we've seen a lot of documentaries where the person gave full access and then regretted it. I think A Tribe Called Quest was one of them. And yeah, yeah. Gary doesn't give off those vibes, fortunately. No, he, you know, he's very much like he would even say to us, like, uh, so, for instance, there's a part in which he talks a little bit about how he has a uh, so there, there was a, a Japanese magazine that for some odd reason decided to reach out to him to have him do an advice column so he would they, it was like a dear abby but it was dear gary and he would and it was printed in japanese so we had all these magazines in japanese but like it was completely bizarre but um you know when i was interviewing him I, I asked if he could give us any advice for making the film and the first thing he said like without missing a beat was like just keep it honest like just say what you have to say and like don't hide any bullshit or like you know i don't know if i can say bullshit but yeah, you can. okay bullshit uh so yeah he said don't hide any of that stuff just be honest tell the tell the the, the truth and I, I think that really was like he gave us full access he just was always ready always wanted to perform for the camera for us mm -hmm. and uh yeah there's definitely no regrets about that i mean you know does he agree with every single thing that everybody says in the film no but it doesn't take away from anything uh, around his participation and uh, his his ultimate like appreciation for the film. Yeah, my personal first exposure to Gary, you know, I didn't know he was the guy from Pavement when I saw Plant Man on Beavis and Butthead, and that yeah. must have been like '94. Do you remember uh, the first time you became familiar with Gary? That was my introduction as well. So I, it's so funny because Beavis and Butthead had a lot of like parodies not parodies but they would make fun of music videos right i mean that was like half of the show and i used to watch that all the time mm -hmm. i don't remember more than a couple of the videos from that show and mm -hmm. that was one of them that i'm like oh yeah plant man like it's it was so iconic and weird it was just there was something about it and i think it's there is something about gary where it's he's just this this guy that like is begging for your attention and he gets it, you know, because he, he's putting it all out there and you can't help but be, um, uh, yeah, just, just be mesmerized by his antics. Uh, so that was that was also my first uh, experience. Out of curiosity, which other videos do you remember? I, you know, for example, I remember the, the Ween one that was in the deli, uh, MC Jesus 5000. I remember sure, that. Sure, sure, sure. Um, 
I think there was the Tom Petty, uh, there was a Tom Petty one where like the Alice in Wonderland with they, they cut yeah. up the cake and stuff. Like I remember that one. Uh, I'm trying to think, I, I yeah, I don't know. The, the Playman one like has a strong, uh, I have a strong memory of that one for sure. I'd have to think about the other ones because it was what whatever was happening at that time. So probably like Nirvana, Spin Doctors, like things like that. But I, I can't even place it. Like I, I don't even remember. But Gary was there. That's how I found him. That's how you found him, yeah. et cetera. And I became a pavement fan after the fact. Was it easy for you to get in touch with people related to pavement for this documentary? Like the band themselves? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, everybody was super down. Like, you know, the, the band went through a lot with him and there was definitely some turbulence and, you know, but ultimately like this is, this is someone that they really cherish. Uh, you know, they, they loved Gary very much and they were, you know, just, just interviewing them. I could really tell like genuinely they cared about him. They cared for him. And there was no question, like all of them were super down. Scott uh, Canberg, uh, also known as Spiral Stairs, was extremely gracious with, um, you know, helping get us archival footage. And, you know, they were, they were just, they were really, you know, so Scott ended up being like an executive producer for us just because, you know, we, we really um, appreciated him and couldn't have really made the movie without him, to be honest, because, yeah, he he, he opened a lot of doors for us. And um, yeah, there I mean, there's just, a, there's a genuine love and appreciation uh, for Gary. And it was, it was touching to see, you know. The last technical question I have about the film. Sometimes when you're clearing music for films, TV, et cetera, the hardest part of the whole process is clearing it in general. In other words, you have the perfect storyline and then you realize <laughs> we have to use 22 seconds of this video. And yeah. then you have a label or one co-writer who goes, no, or they quote too much. I'm assuming everyone was kind of cooperative in this case because you had Scott there. Yeah, yeah. there's cooperation. Yeah, exactly. So all the pavement stuff was super easy. You know, uh, Matador uh, was who we were talking with and just, yeah, everything was just very easy and and, and cool. Um, and then Gary's, his music is, you know, obviously we were like just talking with him and, and uh, uh, Eric Westfall, who's part of this band hospital that they were in together. And he sort of handles a lot of that stuff. So again, everyone was super cool, super easy. There were things that were hard. I mean, like even just like the Beavis and Butthead thing, it's just really expensive. Uh, yeah. TV and Viacom specifically, when you license, I've had other projects where I've licensed through them and it's just, everyone's expensive. And then they are like 10 times more expensive than everyone else. And it's just, it's bananas, but you know, we, we figured it out. It's like one of those things where in the original cut, it's like, there's a lot more of it. And then you start to whittle it down because you sort of have to figure out how to keep it within the the constraints of whatever the budget is for that particular, uh, the archival, you know. Or um, I used to work in a clearances department at Viacom and oh. people just go, <laughs> eh, fair use. Eh. Well, that's the thing. Like, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, that's that's the ultimate question about whether or not but but it's we were sort of told like as soon as you ask about clearing it then you sort of set yourself up to not be able to fair use it but also fair uses kind of gets thrown around a lot what does it really mean and ultimately yeah. anyone you know can sue for any reason they want to so just because you think it's fair use doesn't mean that a big company isn't going to go after you will they will they not like is there precedent for this there's a lot of questions and Sometimes it's just easier to pay the fee, but also sometimes you can't afford the fee. So you just go for it. People get away with all kinds of stuff and people get sued for all kinds of stuff. It's really just a crapshoot. The joys of filmmaking. So, you know, <laughs> hearkening back to the early part of the conversation, you know, right now, tonight you have that Brooklyn showing. Yeah. And ultimately you go to Philadelphia and Texas and San Francisco and then Texas. Right. And and back to New York and then yeah. California and like you're all over the place for a while. Yes. But this is in a way, it's a new film to us. It's an old film to you. Are we allowed right. to know what's coming next? And I say that knowing that you are an Emmy nominated and otherwise <laughs> award women uh, winning filmmaker with great credits. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm just kind of like really just working on a lot of small things right now. And I have a couple ideas that I think are 
potentially really exciting, but it's it's going to be a matter of a fine tuning them and then be finding the right partners, uh, production partners to to make them happen. But I'm I'm excited about future stuff. We'll just have to see if other people are excited about it too. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, can you say is it music related the things so, you're brainstorming? Okay, so one of them is is a uh, I would say more of like a socio political documentary. It's not like political, but it just has to do a lot with like. Um, I I don't really want to say too much more about it because it's like still yeah. it hasn't happened, happened yet. It you hasn't don't happened. Like to talk them, I don't um, think before they happen. But yeah, it's it's sort of you know something that's really uh, fascinating to me about uh kind of race and ethnicity and religion and a lot of kind of ways in which there are um relationships among people that are you know have, it's, there, there's there's you know difficulties in in explaining it without explaining it but right. uh you know the, the generally like that's that's more or less the thing and then another one is i'm writing a whodunit which i've like always been a fan of like i get the christie and that kind of stuff and so very different than this but it's also going to be a music related uh project so uh yeah that's that's my uh that's something i'm really proud of also but we'll see we'll see what happens with that but nothing about van halen <laughs> nothing about van halen no <laughs> No. You just you just have to check because I'm still waiting for that like flood of documentaries and content about Van Halen that has never come. Yeah, one day maybe. One day, <laughs> and then uh, the the last two questions before I let you go. The first one, you're obviously a big music fan, a Slick Rick shirt, Gary yeah. Young documentary, etc. What's the last concert that you went to for fun? Oh, what did I go to? Um... I once okay, this is like a weird one, but I I saw Feist, which like I don't yeah. you know, like um I don't know why like I I sort of like was a little bit reluctant because I'm I'm like yeah she's cool whatever like I like broken social scene and you know and like she's you know her solo stuff is is cool like she's you know but I wasn't like super uh, jazzed about it I was just kind of went with like a couple friends and um, it was incredible. It was incredible. She did something that I've never seen anyone do before. I kind of don't want to ruin it if people haven't seen it before, but I really urge you to see her because she does basically a magic trick. I would say she does like two magic tricks in the in the show. And when the re when the reveals happen, it is mind blowing. I mean, you can look again. I don't want to say what happens because again, you like you'll you'll you, I'm yeah. sure you can read about it if you really want to see, but everybody in the in the audience was just like just jaw on the floor like it was we couldn't believe what just happened and i think that's such a special unusual remarkable experience to have at a, a, a show especially like 2024 like how you know how different is it could it really be like seeing feist or something but it was great so you know um, those those are the best concerts the ones where you go uh, I'll go. And, exactly. You know, I, I had one of those a couple of weeks ago where I wound up with comp tickets to Hootie and the Blowfish, and I went, uh, whatever. And then I'm watching it, with, you know, with my plus one going, is this one of the best concerts you've ever seen? <laughs> I think this is one of the best concerts I've ever seen. That's uh, awesome. Low expectations get you far. I didn't know Darren Rucker was still like doing the Hootie stuff, but I guess, or Dari, Darius Rucker? Yeah, uh, Darius. Yeah, they. I guess they come back every few years and they actually play solo hits and they do a bunch of covers and a bunch of hits. So basically, you know, every single song they're doing. Right. So, and, and in the middle of nowhere, uh, the equivalent of spoiling the Feist magic trick out of nowhere, Darius Rucker started rapping Biggie, I think. What? And then the guitar started rapping the mace part of that song. <laughs> so, you know, I've I spoiled the concert for you, Jed. Ah, uh, well, I guess I'll never be able to see them. Uh, it's it's funny because I mean I remember reading that they kind of came up as a college bar yes. band, so that makes sense because they're like a they understand how to kind of please the crowd and sort of get participation and sort of like you know they understand like what kind of covers they need to play and it just my I remember reading that like record executives thought it was really they were really lame like they were just kind of like yes. a funny band but they just were killing it so much on the local levels that every everywhere that they would play like people would just get super into it that they were just like okay we got to sign them we got to put them out there and if, sure enough they just 
became huge. David Letterman and the rest is history. And yeah. the, the the last question I have for you, you know, putting you on the spot here, because I think that most people who are big music heads who know about Pavement and know Gary, they know Plant Man, and they go, I don't know a second song. Is there a second song that you consider to be the gateway towards getting Gary and really, really liking Gary? Yeah, for his solo stuff. I really like this one called Lost in the Foothills. Uh, it's just like a s acoustic song that he sings. And he actually would sing it at pavement shows uh, sometimes, like toward the end. He would, after everyone was done, he would get up in, with the guitar and he would just sing this uh, this little song that he wrote. And it's actually kind of sweet, you know, it's, it's he, he has, um, he has some like a little poetic kind of moments, you know, there's one in the film that we have where he's singing about getting up in the middle of the night and there's this refrigerator light and this, it's just there, it's haunting. It's, it's, it's really beautiful and sad. And you're like, oh, this is the same guy that made Plant Man. It's, it's not, could not be more different, yeah. but he had a lot of sides to him, you know? So there is the yeah. silly stuff and there's a lot of that uh, in his, in the like hospital material. Uh, they have, they made a, a robot that was a vegetarian robot. This didn't make it into the into the film, but they they built it. Like there's, they literally built this robot uh, in real life. Obviously it's not, not functional, but they, there's all, all this, all these pictures of them. And uh, they made all this whole mythology around this character that was like really just one song about about him and his yeah how he was a robot that ate like vegetables and stuff gary had a thing with vegetables yes and, he did so like there there are themes that come back but um that one's a fun one but yeah that you know lost in the foothills i would i would recommend well congrats on ladder than you think going nationwide and looking forward to what's to come from you whether it's a documentary about music or not whether it's a who done whatever it is looking forward to it jed i really appreciate it thank you and uh yeah, take care.